Hello everybody, this video is on charges, charge objects, and electrostatic forces. This will be the introduction to module 4, electricity and magnetism. The most important question for me to address as we start this topic is to answer the question, what is a charge? Charge is a fundamental property of matter, which means all types of matter, anything with mass, will possess a property known as charge. Charge can either be positive or negative, and it is represented by a symbol Q, and has the SI unit of coulombs, C for short. The reason why all types of matter has this property called charge is because the underlying building block of matter, that is atoms, consists of smaller subatomic particles which themselves have charge. For example, in the simple Rutherford's atomic model, we have protons and neutrons residing in the nucleus, which is the central part of the atom, with electrons orbiting the nucleus. In the atom, protons, which are in the nucleus, are positively charged. Specifically, the value in terms of coulombs is positive 1.602 times 10 to the power of minus 19 coulombs. Electrons, which are orbiting the nucleus, are negatively charged which have the same value in coulombs, but negative in front of the number. Unlike protons and electrons, neutrons, which are also in the nucleus, do not have a charge, so they are neutral or uncharged. In atoms, since the number of protons always equal to the number of electrons, the total charge is always neutral, because the amount of positive charge contributed by the protons should be equal to the number of negative charge contributed by the electrons if the numbers of protons and electrons are equal. So atoms are always neutral. So as we emphasized, matter possess charge because they consist of atoms, and atoms consist of protons and electrons which have positive and negative charges respectively. For most objects, they are uncharged or neutral despite containing protons and electrons, and that's because the number of protons and the number of electrons in these neutral objects are equal. So the net charge is always zero. In this diagram, we have four protons and four electrons. The total amount of positive charge should be neutralized by the total amount of negative charge, contributing to a net charge of zero. Now, hopefully you can imagine then, if we, for some reason, have more protons than the number of electrons, we'll have an excess of positive charge. This excess of positive charge of protons is what makes the whole object or matter to possess a positive charge overall. Vice versa, if we for some reason have more electrons than protons, we'll have an excess of negative charge. This is what makes an object negatively charged. In summary, whether an object or matter is neutral, positively charged or negatively charged depends on the number of protons and electrons it contains. Electrostatic force is a force that's present between charges or charged objects. The most important principle to remember for this type of force is that opposite charges will always attract. So when we have a positive and negative charge or charged objects, there will be an attractive force between them of the same magnitude and like charges will repel. So if we have two negative charges or two positive charges, the force between them will be going away from each other. The exact equation used to calculate the magnitude of force is given by the following. 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught, where epsilon is a constant known as the electric permittivity constant of free space. This number is provided by the NASA physics data sheets. Multiply by Q1 and Q2, which are the magnitude of charges that the force is acting on divided by r squared, where r is the distance between the center of the charges. This equation is very useful to understand the factors that affect the magnitude of electrostatic force. Firstly, the magnitude of electrostatic force is directly proportional to the magnitude of charge, which means if one or both charges increase in magnitude, the magnitude of force should also increase. Vice versa, if the magnitude of charge of one or both charges decreases, then so does their magnitude of electrostatic force. In this example, the first pair of negative charges have a stronger repulsive force between them because one of the negative charge has a larger charge magnitude. In addition, 
the magnitude of electrostatic force is also inversely proportional to the separation distance between the charges squared. So not just the distance, but the distance squared. For example, between the two pairs of positive and negative charges, if we increase the distance between the centers, the force of attraction between them should decrease. The square here is very important to consider because if the distance is doubled from r to 2r, we'll expect the force to decrease by a factor of 4, so it becomes a quarter the magnitude as before. Calculate the force between two point charges, q1 and q2, with the charges provided by the question, separated by a distance of 2 meters. So the electrostatic force is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon naughts times by q1 q2 divided by r squared. The value of epsilon is given by the data sheet, which is 8.854 multiplied by 10 to minus 12 times by the magnitude of two charges. So Q1 is 5 times by 10 to minus 6. And Q2 here, even though it's negative, when we're using this equation, we only need to use the magnitude of the two charges as we are only finding the magnitude of the force. So here we can just write down positive 3 times by 10 to the power of minus 6 and we divide by the distance between them in meters, so it'll be 2 meters squared. This gives the magnitude of the electrostatic force of 0.0337 newtons. Now, of course, force is always a vector quantity, so we also need to describe its direction. Now, remember that for electrostatic forces, the direction simply depends on whether the charges are opposite or alike. In this example, Q1 is positive and Q2 is negative, so this force should be attractive. And the way we describe the direction is by saying this force is towards each other, towards the other charge. Now, we previously have explained why some objects are uncharged or neutral, and the others are either positively charged or negatively charged. We haven't actually explained how do objects become charged. There are three main ways that objects will become charged. Through friction, which is rubbing objects together, through conduction, which is through the physical contact between a charged and uncharged object, or induction, where one charged object is able to influence the charge of another when they are placed in close proximity to each other without physical contact. When objects are rubbed together, the friction created between them usually can cause electrons to be transferred between the objects. Now, it is very important here to understand that only the electrons are transferred in this process because electrons in the atoms are mobile as they orbit the nucleus, whereas the positive protons are residing in the nucleus, so they are more rigid, and as a result, they are not able to be transferred between objects. During this transfer of electrons, the material of object that gains electrons will become negatively charged because they will gain an excess of these negative electrons. Vice versa, the other object or material which will lose electrons will become positively charged because they become electron deficient. They will contain more protons than the number of electrons in their structure. Now, you might be wondering what determines whether the material gains electrons or loses electrons. The direction of electron transfer is dependent on something called the triboelectric series which is a series that lists materials in an order that will tell you their relative tendencies to either gain or lose electrons. On this diagram, I have a simple list of only six objects that you are likely to come across in HSC physics. At the top of the list are materials that are more easily to lose electrons and therefore become positively charged. At the bottom of this series, I have materials that have a greater tendency to gain electrons, therefore more easily become negatively charged. For example, glass out of this entire list is the material that will have a greater tendency to lose electrons and become positively charged in the process. Plastic, on the other hand, is a material that has a greater tendency to gain electrons and therefore become negatively charged through friction or rubbing between the objects. During this transfer of charges through friction, the total amount of charge will remain constant or conserved. So regardless of which material becomes negative and which one becomes positive, if you add the total charges of the two objects together, 
you should not see a difference before and after rubbing them together. So this is known as the conservation of charge. Let's have a look at two examples. If we rub a polyethylene rod, which is a type of plastic with wool cloth, wool cloth is more likely to be positively charged as it has a greater tendency to lose electrons compared to the polyethylene material. So when the friction occurs between the two materials, electrons will be transferred from the wool cloth into the polyethylene rod. This means that the polyethylene rod will become negatively charged while the wool cloth will become positively charged. Now this does not mean that electrons will always be transferred from the cloth into the rod. In this example, when we rub a glass rod with a wool cloth, glass rod has a greater tendency than the wool cloth to lose electrons. So the electron transfer is in the opposite direction from the glass rod into the wool cloth, which means the glass rod by losing electrons will become positive in the process, whereas the wool cloth by gaining electrons will become negative in the process. The second way through which objects become charged is through conduction, which is when a charged object becomes in contact with a neutral object. When a positive object is in contact with a neutral object, the excess positive charge or protons in a positive object will exert an attractive force on the mobile electrons in a neutral object. So you'll expect the electrons to be transferred from the neutral object into the positive object. Now this electron transfer causes the positive object to gain electrons, so it will become less positive. At the same time, the neutral object no longer have an equal number of protons and electrons. Specifically, it has an excess of protons. So the neutral object here will also become positive. So through conduction, both objects are now positive. When a negative object is in contact with the neutral object, the opposite transfer pattern occurs. The negative object will donate some of its electrons to the neutral object, which causes itself to become less negative because now it has a smaller excess of electrons. And the neutral object, by gaining an excess of electrons, it has now become negatively charged. So in this example, both objects through the action of conduction and the transfer of electrons are now negatively charged. So in essence, conduction is when electron transfer occurs between a charged object and a neutral object. And as a result of conduction, the neutral object will always acquire the same type of charge as the charged object that caused the conduction in the first place. So in this first example, the neutral object has become positive, and in the second example, the neutral object has become negative. Again, conduction obeys the conservation of charge. Regardless of which direction the electrons are transferred to and from, if you count the total charge in both objects, it should remain the same. And this is because the total amount of protons and electrons in both objects should be unchanged. The last way through which an object becomes charged is induction. Induction refers to the redistribution of charge within a neutral object due to a nearby charged object. Unlike conduction, induction does not involve any physical contact between the objects. It only requires the two objects to be close enough so that the charges in the charged object can exert an electrostatic force on the charges in the neutral object. For example, when we place a negatively charged object in close proximity to the neutral object, the excess electrons in the negative object will exert an attractive force on the protons in the neutral object and a repulsive force on the electrons. Since electrons are more mobile than the protons, the overall effect of these electrostatic forces is that the negative electrons in the neutral object are repelled away from the negatively charged object, while the protons should remain relatively stationary due to their less mobile nature. As a result of this electron movement, we have a predominantly positively charged region on the left-hand side and a predominantly negatively charged region on the right-hand side of the object. This is what we mean by redistribution of charge. So induction does not change the overall charge of the object, this object here still remains overall neutral, 
but it redistributes the charges such that one end of the object becomes positive and the other end becomes negative. This phenomenon has an effect on the interaction between the two objects. Since this neutral object has become positively charged on the side that's closer to the negatively charged object, there will be an attractive electrostatic force between them. And that's why effectively this neutral object should be treated as a charged one. So throughout this video, I've already emphasized multiple times the principle of conservation of charge. In any interactions between charges or processes through which objects become charged, the total amount of charge in a given system or objects involved in the interaction should remain constant. And that's because charges are ultimately due to protons and electrons in these objects and the number of electrons and protons should not change in a given interaction. I want to also speak about quantization of charge. In a given object, whether it's positively charged or negatively charged, the magnitude of charge in coulombs should be quantized, meaning it should always be an integer multiple of the magnitude of charge of electrons or protons. For example, in a negatively charged object that contains two excess electrons, the total charge of this object should be two times the charge of one electron. In this negatively charged object that has an excess of three electrons, the total charge of this object should be three times the electric charge of the electron. The total charge of the object should be a whole number or integer multiple of the electric charge of either electrons if the object is negatively charged or of protons if the object is positively charged. And lastly, charges will always interact with electric and magnetic fields. And this topic will be discussed in further detail in their own videos. This concludes a video on charges, charge objects, and electrostatic forces. Hey everyone, if you found this video helpful, smash that like button and don't forget to subscribe. Want even more? Become a Patreon member for early access to videos, exclusive Discord discussions about questions on chemistry and physics, and live preparation sessions for your exams. Don't forget to head over to our website for topic tests and practice exams to further improve your understanding and learning.